in the Goetha in Berlin will introduce the first moon extension with scholarly publishing esteem from the academic community. And we are very glad to have James Evans here as the keynote speaker. Then after the most important bit of the day, the networking, we come to analytics, which is chaired by Dr. Andreas Voss from Voss Media. Um, after lunch, very interesting, the fragmentation of publishing. We see that a lot of quite usually smaller companies are honing in on parts of the publishing process. And because they're specializing in it, they promise to do a very decent job of just that fragment of what needs to be done to get from manuscript to cited publication. Very interesting. And then finally, just like last year, we have an open discussion with the room. We call it a soapbox. And that means that everybody who wants can stand up and be heard, and then we can discuss things. Okay. So a quick introduction to the committee. Um, Andreas, where are you? Andreas Voss, Voss Media, publisher of Advanced Topical Technology. Martin Rulans from Springer, he is a publisher in neuroscience. That is his real job, and he's even a doctor in neuroscience. Unfortunately to, to him, we have made him a bit of a nerd today. Um, he's been very kindly to try to get the things working, and a lot of things are working. We're just, as said, waiting for the uh, internet connection. We need that for the Hangout, and we need that to be able um, to give you the opportunity to tweet during the day. You can check up on some mails, but don't show that to us. Um, then Michael Weisinger, Pulse Technologies, and Semantic Enhancement of Microcontent. And finally, Dr. Felix Ebert from the Greuther. Um, I asked Felix uh, this morning, can you tell me a bit about yourself? I mean, I know Felix for quite a few years, and I said, are there any fun facts? And he said, well, you could mention that last year I published my first paper, and that is on the history of German pubs in the 18th century. And that seems to me kind of a worthwhile paper to read, and perhaps to, to try and reproduce um, the, the experience of testing all these pubs. OK, um, new media, new technologies, uh, they are very good thriving in the publishing industry. And we have, that's why we're so anxious about the internet connection, um, we have a very inter uh, international uh, group of speakers. Some are at the moment in San Francisco, one is in Beijing. China, and they will be all joining us through Google Hangouts. Um, we've announced that on the program, LinkedIn uh, tweeted it. Um, so they will be kind of joining us live from the other side of the globe. And the whole thing will be streamed through a Google Hangout. And we are going to look forward to a lot of people interacting with us from across the globe hopefully giving their ideas through the Twitter wall, joining the discussion later. So um, that's one thing. Uh, there you see on two slides now the APE 2014, the official hashtag. And I think I'm at the end of my slides, Martin, with, oh yeah. I'm sorry about that. Here is a few of the statements which have been pre-entered for the soapbox. So the idea this afternoon uh, is in the last session that anybody who has something to say, a statement, a feeling, a desire, an opinion that he wants to voice, just stand up, be heard, and we'll try to guide everybody through a discussion with the 90 odd people here in the room. OK, um, important things. Right after the conference, there will be drinks here, kind of uh, in the bar. 
And for anybody who wants to join us, as of 7.30, we will um, be having drinks in a bar called the Meisterschule Gallery and Bar. Um, it's pretty close by, it's about a five minute walk from here. And this afternoon is becoming a mantra once the internet gets working. We'll kind of be able to show you a little map. Um, it is take a left out of the hotel, left on the Friedrichstraße, walk straight for about 750 meters, over the bridge, and take a ride, and then it's the bar. Or talk and drink about the latest day. Um, I think I hand over to, to Felix to introduce James. Well, this is why I um, would like to work in your spot. I'm very happy that you are waiting for one of the groom code of that. I'm delighted, I really am, um, to introduce James Sullivan. Um, he's a sociologist at the University of, uh, University of Chicago. He published on the ecosystem of institutional research and innovation. And on top of that, he contributes to the University of Chicago Knowledge Lab which is a very impressive network dedicated to meta research on all aspects of knowledge creation and transmission. And just to give you an idea of that um, network as such, a wonderful projects such as the aesthetics of explanation, like that. I could resist to mention that. Finally, um, I'd like to give a special thank to Data Group, um, one of uh, the greatest, most appreciated service providers that made it possible supporting um, the conference and having to have her here. So, good morning and welcome. Hello. I was uh, hoping that's not too loud there. Okay. Close, but not too close. Anyway, well, uh, welcome everyone to this conference and thanks so much for uh, inviting me. It's a delight to be here today. I, uh, we have synced out. Um, so um, I'm from the University of Chicago, and it's it's a delight to speak with publishers. I um, I live off publishers. Uh, I, I, I you know feed on, on publishers' data, and I reflect on um, the nature of that data, and I think what some of what can kind of be explored uh, and considered as a, as a function of, of uh, publication data. I'm going to talk about how does science as a system think. Um, uh, and I'm going to go to Chicago and learn this knowledge line that you know, it's just mentioned. Um, so, uh, so publication, uh, you know, is um, both digital and um, um, and paper right? ends up being this this source of so many things for science. I'm probably wonder about different aspects of of, uh, of this data. So one can think about you know the stack, which is available both online and uh, individually in print. Um, but one can think further uh, if you use natural language processing technologies, if uh, one uses uh, name entity recognition, uh, one uses a host of other kinds of information theoretic and probabilistic and uh, graph theoretic models. One can kind of split out the pieces of publications uh, into you know, an enormous network of authors and, you know, linked by institutions and, and by the places of residence, there are hosts that one can think about sources of funding that are also kind of cross-linked with forms of uh, expression um, and the underlying concepts that they're trying to capture. Uh, and all these things, um, one can think about publishing in a number of ways. One is, is different kinds of history. Right? So publishing as a kind of social history Right? So one can strip out from publishing the context of science, right? the kind of social history of science. Right? One can see over the course of the end of the 19th and beginning of uh, the 20th centuries, uh, up to the 21st century, this rise of teams, uh, even in the arts and humanities, but also uh, virtually everywhere else, the expansion of collaboration networks, the kind of greater inequality of institutional prestige across these collaboration networks, interdependence of Technologies and the accumulation of technologies into kind of research pipelines uh, that end up you know having shorter and shorter descriptions. One can also see publishing as a kind of intellectual history of science, right? Obviously, one can trace 
across all these, these papers when you kind of compute through the lives of concepts, the kind of demography of concepts, one can explore the diffusion of models and metaphors and methods across these papers. One can um, explore the paradigm shifts in assumptions and interests that take place over the long terrain. One can also look at the evolution and extinction of the disciplines of inquiry more generally. Um, publishing also can be seen as a kind of science studies, right, or as the substrate of which one can engage in science studies. So one can look at the context of science, the rise of teams, expansion of networks, inequality and technologies on the lives of concept, the fusion of models, metaphors, paradigm shifts, and, and field extensions, right? So the way in which these different um, social bases of, of, um, of science end up actually shaping its, its contents. Um, but the thing that I want to focus on today is really publishing and publication as a neural network. And I'm just going to grab this water, right? Uh, something cold. So um, I'm going to argue that scientists think through the complex network of context and content in actually uh, shaping their own scientific ideas. Um, you know, initially, kind of tediously, maybe, I'm going to make this argument through um, uh, what David said. And I'm going to explore some implications and some other ones. And then I, I welcome your comments uh, and, and argument on this matter. Um, so um, initially, I'm, I'm going to kind of draw an idea from uh, Alan Moore and Herbert Simon. In 1971, they published a piece called Human Problem Solving. As a model, they used chess, uh, but they suggested a whole host of possible other models. And they described this idea of a network of possible wonders through which problem solvers sought solutions. Right? There were a whole host of cognitive paths through which people could walk to come to these solutions. Um, and my model of scientists in this context is somewhat impoverished one, uh, right? Scientists as insect, right? Uh, but even, you know, with the scientist as insect, you know, that kind of maybe is walking randomly, but then through interacting with the physical structures and pheromones and each other can create elaborate structures like this ant colony. Um, similarly, sometimes uh, I, I'm suggesting that we're advised not to take these um, kind of cathedrals of science, like this large hadron collider or this root system of the exceptional group E8 uh, as uh, impenetrable objects, right? But as things that kind of scientists through simple acts of accumulation and inference uh, can uh, build up through generations of scientific activity. Uh, as an initial uh, example, I'm going to talk about this in the context of, of Medline. So Medline is about a $20 million, uh, 20 million publication corpus uh, of biomedical abstracts that's accumulated and annotated by the National Library of Medicine. Um, it has papers that go back through uh, the end of the 19th century, but it doesn't really attain the density until about 1950. Um, and, and here we've got uh, the rise of this uh, stack of publications over time, right? Uh, we have the number of authors which is rising uh, faster than the number of papers, and these are a handful of annotations, right? So these are the number of uh, diseases which you can do it over time, the number of chemicals, and the number of methods which you use across these papers. Um, this is the average degree. This is the essentially the number of things that each of these annotations attach to each year. Obviously, authors have a bunch of things that they can attach to, uh, but uh, essentially each of these other things, uh, chemicals, diseases, and methods, become more and more popular each year, connected to more and more papers. This is the per paper uh, connections, right? And so what we see here is we have a rising number of authors, so this is the growth of teams. This is the average movement really from two to four authors over the span of the, the last half of the 20th century, which ends up rising uh, linearly with the number of methods, right? So essentially, this is what authors are bringing to papers. You've got these multi-person teams which are bringing new technologies. Um, uh, so this is from one to two technologies. And these are the topics, right? So these are the diseases and chemicals that are inside these papers. Of course, they can have a, a richer vocabulary of topics. Um, if one explodes this into a network and thinks about, well, okay, so what happens in the next year as a function of what's studied in the current year? Um, 
And one, what one finds is that authors typically connect with new authors um, by connecting with friends of a friend, right? with people that are two blocks apart. I mean, most of the people they publish with are published with poor or brand new to the system. Right? So these are their afterlives, their students, their postdocs. Um, people who are entering the system for the first time. But for the most of the rest, these are friends of a friend. If you look at chemicals that combine, all of the chemicals that newly combine the system are friends of a friend, or chemicals that react with, with a chemical that's two chemicals away in the stem. And virtually everything that authors uh, connect to newly, both topics and methods, end up being kind of friend of a friend. So we're going to look at the, the, the space in which um, scientists and science uh, explores the space as a whole. And, and I'm going to describe this this array of publications as kind of a growing hypergraph, which is a set of each of these nodes are authors or chemicals or methods. And a paper is a set that links them together. Um, and so one can imagine this paper here from LCD. And if he protects hippocampal neurons against multiple toxins, it's got this array of authors, these chemicals, uh, and uh, related uh, topics, in this case, um, of hampering some neural function. And if he is this uh, um, uh, protective uh, 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 kind of acid. Um, so I, I'm going I'm to imagine that, that scientists, like those ants that we looked at earlier, all they do is they kind of randomly walk on this neural network of publications. Which is to say they read these publications and they think. Science is a system that thinks through these publications. Um, and we find, when we look at that, is that science as a system changes over time. Uh, for example, in the 1950s, most of the things become connected over time as a function of <coughs> connected through scientists. Uh, whereas in the later period, things become connected by these, these other elements, which I'll describe in, in detail. Right? So basically, you've got you know, these random walkers uh, moving over time, and we're exploring what's the likelihood that they pass through to, you know, for authors to become connected with one another, what, what's the path through which they become connected? It turns out they, they become connected through all kinds of things. But, but one thing that's interesting about chemicals, methods, and diseases over this time is that initially in this period, they're more likely to become connected as a function of authors. Right? So I'm more likely to, to um, uh, chemicals are more likely to connect because uh, there's an author that I know, essentially, that is working on one of those things and somebody I know is working on another one and so I'm going to connect with this function showing up at a seminar um, or having a conversation in the hall. The same with diseases and methods. But over time, all of those things become the passage points. Diseases connect through diseases. Methods connect through methods. Chemicals connect through chemicals. And um, we find, of course, Scientists aren't just random walkers, so we can actually predict what it is that ends up getting connected in the scientific space. Uh, and we find, uh, and so we, we multiply those probabilities by these random walk likelihoods, and we find, um, again, that, that this friend of a friend dynamic is, is critical. See this part, it's almost over. Um, and uh, what's, what's interesting here is that this ends up, we find, predict about 90, more than about 95% of all the scientific connections that end up getting made in the future. So these are basically what's called the area under the curve, uh, which is the true positive versus the false positive rate. So what's the likelihood that if scientists move in the way that we describe, so which is to say if they actually walk through publications, if they think through publications to come up with their next research idea, then this ends up explaining, you know, almost 100%, but 95% of the connections that, that are made um, over time. And we find that one of the ways that validates that is that, is that the thing, the friend of a friend that they connect to, ends up also showing up in that paper, right? So the author that they connect you with ends up showing up in the paper. The method that the two chemicals connect you with ends up showing up in the paper. It's kind of validation that this is in fact the way in which science thinks uh, as an institution. And this is the way in which scientists typically think. Um, uh, obviously, uh, people do more than just read papers. They go to conferences, and you know they have deep references somewhere around. But typically, um, these things themselves get reflected in the publishing literature. And so, 
Um, my argument really is that this is you know, a really deep resource, not only for kind of archive in the past of science and understanding the production function of science, but talking about the future of science. Right? This is the springboard on which um, science is, is moving towards the future. So we see here the scientists appear to think through the literature by wandering locally. Uh, and the methods, uh, one thing I didn't highlight, are the most prominent path by which things become which is to suggest that the scientists themselves are typically one third times. You know, they, they, it's a labor theory value in these papers. Like they do one thing well, and that's the thing through which they end up connecting with new elements in their, their, their labor work. Because other people use those same tools to say other things. Um, I'm just going to mention uh, another, I think, validation that, um, that publishing is the substrate on which science is built, or it's a deeply influenced in the way in which science is a system thinks. This is some earlier work that I published um, in Science about five years ago, um, which showed the influence of the internet on the scientific space of attention, right? So the, the space of, of papers that scientists think about. So before the internet, um, you have individual scientists who use square blocks, typically thinking about a whole range of publications balls that are larger, very important publications, you know, the science and nature uh, of, of uh, you know, interdisciplinary fields. But they also were aware of, you know, the little things. You know, they're aware of these, these, you know, they had taste, right? So they, you know, knew about smaller publications in their field and they expressed those tastes in the usual way. After the internet, what you see is that people essentially gave up many of those local tastes, reached out further as they reach further into this scientific system, they rely on the advice of others uh, and ended up kind of giving up these local uh, tastes for um, important publications in other areas. Uh, and so, in some sense, even as individuals became more diverse, they drew on a larger body of things, the whole system became less diverse because every time you gave up uh, expressing or exploring local knowledge in your space, you are reaching into a space in which you have no taste. Uh, and so you effectively use the Google mechanism. You know, it's like if, if uh, you know, if you know Italian restaurants in your neighborhood, then, um, you know, you'll go to the right one. If you don't know anything about Italian restaurants in your neighborhood, you'll go to the Olive Garden, uh, you know, which is kind of a, a McDonald's, you know, a high throughput chain. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I found this, uh, both these dynamics at the level of, uh, um, publications in a, in a corpus of, uh, of about uh, 10 million papers where basically when article references go online it increases the likelihood uh, that they'll be in a different field, uh, which is to say that people when they're online are willing to search further to other publications and other areas. Uh, and also though when papers come online, uh, people end up kind of citing, referencing Fewer papers, more recent papers, and the kind of the the, um, the focus of of uh, the papers becomes more narrow. So individuals become broader and journals become narrow. Which is uh, our individuals become broader, the whole system becomes narrow. Again, another um, you know, kind of argument for the centrality of publishing as as a kind of a substrate on which science is a system of things. Um, uh, and so, as a result, you have, as a function of interconnections of, of the web, for scientists, humanists in the world, it, it, it ends up focusing people to, to know more about less. Right? So, the benefits to this efficiency is it resolves to what's important to the, to the field, but the cost is that older, specialized, less digestible knowledge ends up getting lost uh, in, this, in this new, new world system. Okay, now I'm going to take um, my last uh, uh, remaining minutes and talk about um, a quantitative case in some detail. Um, so imagine now that we're just focusing on how does the scientists explore the chemical space, right? Rather than just kind of the fact that science as a whole ends up using this uh, literature uh, as a substrate for thinking. Um, and I'm going to talk about this question of choosing the next experiment. What is it we can learn from, from this as a case and then uh, broaden to what we can think about uh, as a whole? So how do scientists choose the next experiment? Obviously, there's subtle things, right? There's past experiences, there's training, 
the serendipity of walking to the right seminar or bumping to the right person at the right time. Um, uh, another key dynamic is, are you going to follow the crowd, um, or are you going to kind of light off on your own? Um, and if you follow the crowd, then this kind of ensures a certain level of productivity, right? Because these are tried and, and, and tested uh, experimental approaches that you're copying, or lighting on your own, possibly falling off the treadmill of professional productivity, uh, but also potentially discovering something uh, new and, and illuminating and, and radical. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to measure this, this novelty and the, the riskiness associated with it is the, kind of the probability that knowledge and the process of science is going to yield some discovery. If this is high, if everybody knows what you're doing is going to yield the outcome that you find, then there's not much novelty there. If nobody knows it, if it's extremely surprising, um, then the probability for that discovery is very small, which is associated with high novelty. So this is what uh, Thomas Kuhn called the essential tension, right? Uh, which in our modern world could be translated as the difference between a publication of nature paper between a job and in, in the United States, or the career award between uh, tenure and the Nobel Prize, right? Uh, so um, I'm just going to, to make this simple, I'm going to kind of break out simple strategies that scientists engage in into a few different parts, some of which are more and some of which are less novel, some of which are more and some of which are less risky. So scientists can radically kind of jump to a new chemical. They get introduced an entirely new chemical into the system. Um, they can connect things that already exist in new ways, or they can repeat things. And they can um, consolidate existing subfields by connecting things that are kind of close to one another, or they can bridge different subfields, either repeatedly or in new ways. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm growing this network as a function of chemicals published together in experiments, so that this network is, is tied together, linked by the number of experiments in which these chemicals uh, appear together. Um, and Medline is, again, the source of this data. Uh, the, so the network is about 200,000 nodes and, and about uh, 85 million links as it grows over time. There are a few uh, links that are extremely important uh, that have many ties, and there are many that have a few ties. And the same with the connections. Some connections are repeated thousands and thousands of times. Others just a few. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention is how we define the subfields. Again, uh, I'm unleashing random walkers uh, and those places, those neighborhoods that they retread very commonly end up being neighborhoods that correspond roughly to broad scientific areas. Core biology chemicals, things like DNA and molecular biology, which you see uh, splits out from these core biological chemicals in about 1985. Um, neurotransmitters, uh, hormones and sex hormones, uh, <coughs> cholesterol, lipids, antibacterial agents. You even see the emergence of, of important, currently important subfields like the second messenger system, which kind of solidifies in about 1993. Um, and of course, all these, these core uh, subfields become more important over time. So recall, this is how I'm going to define these simple strategies. And what I find is that from the 1980s to the present, these uh, solid lines uh, show the, the, the proportion of these strategies over time, which is remarkably stable. So you're repeatedly engaging in bridges and consolidations at about 45 or a little over 40 percent each. Um, you're engaging in kind of newly bridging subfields at about 10 percent, uh, and new consolidations and jumps at, at 5 and, and, and 3 percent. Um, so these are very rare uh, and uh, quite potentially risky. Um, what's interesting about that stability is that that occurs at the same time as this enormous explosion of chemicals into the database over time, and a massively growing number of opportunities to engage in more and more risky strategies. So these are the opportunities to engage in each of these behaviors. Um, so what you see is even though this is scientists are engaged in the same mix of strategies with the same risk profile over time. Because of all the new opportunities that they're foregoing, essentially this means that there's a strong preference for repeated 
uh, engagements over new possible engagements. So essentially, science is becoming more conservative uh, over time in this period. Um, one finds, on the other uh, hand, that this kind of surprisal, right, this, this, the surprisingness or the riskiness of the strategy, um, ends up having a positive relationship with the average citations. Right? So basically, more risky strategies end up, uh, and I should say, the dispersion over time. So each of these corresponds to each of the strategies, and year accounts for almost all of this scooping up of variation. Right, so if you account for a year of this relationship, it explains about not yet well, over 80% of of, uh, of the variation in these citations. Basically, you know, more uh, uh, more risky strategies end up being more likely to have bigger outcomes, but they're also more likely to have a more varied range of outcomes. Right, so the more risky thing that you do ends up being less likely to succeed, but if it succeeds, it succeeds dramatically. Um, and uh, so now it turns out that observed investment in riskier strategies is not actually rational if scientists were just trying to maximize citations because, because these risky strategies are more likely to fail. Right? So there's a whole host of these strategies that will never be cited or never published. Um, uh, if they were, uh, if they were rational. Uh, then new strategies would have to be only 25% more risky than repeated old strategies. Uh, and jumping to the top of new chemicals would only be 35% more risky if, if they were maximizing citations. So it suggests that scientists are actually engaged in some risky behavior, um, but some risks don't bear out, right? Some connections should never be made, like this connection between canning and sandwich technology, right? There's, there's some uh, there's some strategies that uh, that simply uh, don't uh, don't bear fruit, um, and so what motivates scientists to engage in risk taking? Well, potentially uh, exceptional achievement, right? Highly cited papers and, and awards, and we find when we look at the, the frequency of these strategies over time. So these are jumps, and these are these uh, repeat uh, consolidations of bridges. We basically take all of the prizes. Um, that uh, I could find uh, in the world that weren't tagged to a particular place. Uh, so all of the prizes associated with medicine, with chemistry, and with biology uh, over the course of, of the second half of the 20th century, and we link them with these papers over time. What we find is that the top 1% of citations and elite prizes, these are the Nobel Prizes and kind of the pre-Nobels, ones that prizes that predict Nobel Prizes, um, are much more enriched. You know, they have more than 200% as many of these risky strategies, of these jumps. Um, they're also uh, more than uh, 150%, so they have more than uh, you know, one and a half times as many of these new consolidations. So, um, and you can see this is especially true for elite prizes, for Nobel Prizes. You get rewarded by a community for linking things that haven't been connected in that community. You've got an audience built in to appreciate those um, those connections, um, and uh, and they're much less likely to engage in re repeat strategies over time. So this suggests that scientists are kind of motivated by these uh, these papers, which are doing exactly what uh, their kind of probability distribution of the risk is moving them towards. Um, one last kind of question I'm going to pose is how efficient is what it is that they're doing. Um, and this is a trickier question because I don't have an archive of what it is that they didn't do, right? Uh, but I'm going to try to reconstruct that with this system of publications and I actually believe that it gives us some clues as to how one might do that. So let's consider for a moment that scientists actually consider this whole network of ties that their chemicals or their concepts in a broader world um, connect through. And that they consider the relative importance of their um, subjects in this network, which is kind of the centrality of their networks in the subject. They also consider the distance between them. All right? So more distant things would be more risky. They're less likely to combine. No one's combined them before. No one's combined their neighbors before. And uh, so each paper, in some sense, kind of inscribes a connection between things that are more or less central. Um, right? So this. 2000 paper that kind of eradicated the likelihood of hormone therapy that connects to extremely central things, cholesterol and estrogen, 
Uh, and other things that use you know, novel therapeutics in, in new ways, right? so less central things. Um, and you can see, again, that the publication space, um, the connection of these chemicals uh, over time uh, is, is, you know, reveals, for example, the kind of within country linkages um, that end up occurring over time to, kind of, to, to link, in this case, 1996, linkages between the level and shadow mice and B. Uh, in Canada, but only as a function of the connection of these authors to kind of a, a, a worldwide um, uh, um, collaboration of scientists that are, that are close to them. Um, so what we find is that scientists typically, uh, they connect things that are very important uh, uh, and, um, and that, however, citations end up accumulating uh, in much more diverse things, especially things that are kind of less important in that system things that one might expect to be riskier. Um, scientists also, prize-winning scientists, end up jumping further in this, uh, in this space. And, and they become more conservative over time. So they end up walking uh, less far uh, over time as the scientific system um, consolidates. This is a, a simple probabilistic model that I use to estimate those strategies that scientists use and then to sweep this possibility space to see if there are more efficient strategies. Um, basically, what I see systematically is that scientists, again, prefer more central things over time, and they walk less distant over time uh, in this space. Um, I take a sample of this network, uh, and I, uh, I estimated this, these strategies, which show the, kind of the relative importance of these central nodes. Um, and I find that basically the actual strategy, which is associated with the, the, the corpus of publications, ends up being about the most efficient strategy for discovering 10% of that network of scientific um, connections. It's, but it's unbelievably inefficient discovering the whole corpus of things that it has been used to discover. Right? There are much more efficient strategies of discovering more of this publication space. And I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry for these numbers, but, but all I mean to show you by this is, so, you know, all I mean to show you by this is that basically, if you were to be really efficient, you'd do exactly the opposite of what the publication system is. So basically, in early years, you'd become, you'd be very conservative, you'd just connect central things. In later years, because of the kind of the fractal nature of the network, you'd be much more risky, right? Uh, you connect things that have a low probability of, of connecting uh, components in the network, but, um, but their connection would end up rewiring the whole system of science. Um, so this is, your strategy would be much more even uh, across the space. Um, so I think my time is coming to a close. One can also uh, test alternative search strategies. So one thing we do is we look at not only the system of science as a bunch of uncoordinated scientists, but what if people published all their failures? as well as their successes. Well, not surprisingly, um, you do about 200% better. Uh, and at the end of the publication cycles, you kind of close in on, on understanding everything in an area. Um, coordination ends up giving you dramatic advantages. Um, so um, you know, there are many places one could go next. Uh, obviously, the reason why we picked biomedicine is because um, the nouns and verbs are best behaved there. Uh, this is a measure of ambiguity uh, of, of essentially terms within the space. The humanities, uh, you can extract concepts from the humanities, uh, but they're, they're, it's much less predictable, essentially, what those contexts are going to be and how stable they're going to be over time. So we're excited about moving into the space of, of math and humanities and social sciences, but it's harder to do than what we've just been doing. Um, so how is science think? Well, it's changing its mind, right? Initially, science moves through people, and now it increasingly moves through these maps. Methods end up being special connectors, and scientists are like one-trick ponies in what they do. It's stable research habits over time. It's not sensitive to changes in the space of scientific possibilities. Um, this accruing kind of essential tension driven by the imitation of those who are rewarded in the scientific system. The, the search strategy is efficient for discovery of about 10% of what we know, and it's much more efficient when um, failures are published. Uh, and obviously, you can imagine policy uh, uh, approaches associated with encouraging high-risk work and, and the increased publication failures, which would, would change the, the, the uh, 
efficiency of the system. Um, all this to say, just in conclusion, is that you know knowledge about knowledge that we've kind of extracted from this really rich publication space ends up allowing new publication institutions and really machine-enabled science. As we understand the system, we can kind of nudge it in various ways such that scientists increasingly are moving from just asking the questions that kind of come out of their back pockets to asking the questions uh, and asking and generating algorithms that generate essentially the most fruitful questions uh, over time. Um, so uh, that's all. Thank you for your time. Um, I'll take any questions as we're transitioning <laughs> to the next speaker. If there are any questions, arguments, disputes. Uh -huh. I have one question that probably I have to back up on. I have a question that follows on from what this was said last, which I, I thought was, a, was an interesting criticism of the way the scientific system has been operating the last 20 years. I was wondering whether you'd share that then, if I make it explicit. So you said from the people for more risky projects and so on and so on. So the last 20 years in my reading has been a lot of research-driven funding of the academy. And of course, research-driven funding usually means project-driven. And this has also um, uh, been a driver in the way, say, publishing has, um, has, has moved forward. So when, looking back over the past 20 years, would you say that the era where you prefer to fund research projects and there are less people in secure tenure jobs make science more conformist, less risk taking? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when you have the last generation deeming what's appropriate and relevant for the next generation to study, that's going mean, to, that's, that's the, and that is the definition of conservatism, right? When you fund people based on a historical trajectory of relevance and the predictability of that project to yield assimilatable findings, that's by definition, conservative. So, uh, now I'm not saying that there haven't been benefits that have come from conservative research. Right? I mean, we develop technologies, we you know we work out the concepts of jokes, but for discovery, for discovering the space of possibilities, it's extremely important. Uh, and I think we can demonstrate that right now. I mean, we're setting up ex ante experiments in, in genomics, which is a context where you've got tons of data, and the real bottleneck is intelligent questions. So we're feeding them these higher-risk questions and looking at the relative likelihood of success. I mean, the tricky thing is exactly what this means for individual scientists. Is it better uh, you know, to, to, to find you know, scientists that have had a success in the past? Uh, that would be true if they're scientists that have better and worse taste. But if scientists succeed literally as a function of being ants randomly walking into space, then that also would be that strategy. You know, there have been benefits to the Bell Labs approach uh, in the U.S., you know, where you kind of invest heavily in industrial research, it's completely decoupled from individual performance uh, over time. But what sustained that research? Right, a monopoly. Uh, so there were all kinds of, you know, social costs which were skimmed off to to create the the war chest that was reinvested in research. So, so I, I think they're they're not easy answers, but but uh, I think this hopefully nudges us in, in the direction of certain certain possibilities. Thanks. Uh -huh. So one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, have you looked at the grants uh, databases to actually uh, you know, confirm or deny some of your, uh, your ideas about um, science and publishing? Because you've got the whole networks of uh, people who are also getting funded together. And now all of that is online. So. Right. Yes. So, so we, so we, we are harvesting, uh, and we have a couple of projects right now which explore these these grants databases. It turns out that publications typically flow from grants, but not always. Right. So, this is true with like U.S. Cold War physics, for example. Right. Was was DARPA and all of these investments uh, in physics hijacking the physics community, or were phys uh, physicists hijacking? Uh, government money, right? Right. So it, it, it turns out that some of both was taking place, and, and we're not far enough along that project to really identify. But what you're saying is, I mean, if this reflects public, if, if this reflects granting activity, then the one reinforces the other. If it doesn't, right? Uh, which is to say, people receive grants uh, for projects and then do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, 
then we'll be able to hopefully identify uh, those differences. And, 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 but, you know, so my hunch is that um, funding, I would be blown away if the funding was actually more radical and scientists themselves were just uh, pushing it down. But I would say that you know, the, the peer review system of funding ends up doing the same thing that publication review does. Uh, but new models of funding, uh, like the HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and there are other approaches that tag individual researchers. The Gates Foundation, which tags highly risky projects, but with a potentially practical end. Uh, and I think you know these are these are ways of nudging science outside, essentially, of the conservatives and the peer review uh, in science. Uh, so, do you have a question? Was that? Am I up? Okay, good. Oh, uh -huh. I was asked to stand up and say my name. I'm Michelle Limster. I compliment you on your findings, which are really fascinating. But I wonder in which way it pertains to, public, to a scientific publishing because uh, whether we publish uh, uh, relevant and interesting and new papers, um, or whether we just repeat publishing more or less the, the same uh, things, it's all the same to publishing and to the to the economic process of publishing. Okay, so okay, so you'll be the judge of whether this is relevant to you at all uh, or not. But but let me just suggest that I believe this says that inside the publications there is a treasure trove of value. Uh, and, and by this, I don't just mean symbolic value for me, you know, in my little lab to kind of tool around. I mean, this is real value, right? If, if this can help, if this publication, you know, permafrost, you know, can help us nudge science in directions that end up, you know, increasing the profitability, uh, and by profitability, I really mean the kind of utility of the outcomes, uh, you know, the, the, the return on investment to science, um, then this, there's services that can be generated out of this content that can be used by scientists to direct their efforts, right? So I think, I mean, you know, publication is not just a, you know paper and now an online business. It's about the value add on, on top of this as well. And you know, all the publishers uh, present here, you know, offer databases of various types, or at least their content to databases, and in some cases have have services that kind of synthesize and suggest. You know, recommend relevant papers, recommend, recommend relevant ideas. All I'm suggesting is one could push that, push that uh, publication up the value stream to really increase the, the productivity of science. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Thanks. Um, uh, but before we go forward, I um, I would like to to let you know that um, codes for for the internet access that I will be well, um, just. You know, you will be able to, to provide that. Mm -hmm. but to mine. And you know, yeah, we have individual codes right now. Those on. people that would like to use the internet uh, during the presentations. So, uh, Catherine over there, uh, we can over here, here have That's forms. Right. If you would like to have them, just raise your hands. Then you get a form for your internet That's access. We right. have more than 60 right now. Um, so, over here, yeah, over here, over here. Yeah, everybody has to. So now you can tweet forever. Okay, well. okay. Um, as long as you set up your personal internet, I'm uh, happy to introduce Anita Brandowski. He's come to us from the uh, West Coast of the United States. Um, Anita has started her career as an electrophysiologist. I moved to your company that you may have worked for, the Sidera, um, the biotech company that finished the first human genome. And she basically just explained that she helped that company making sense of that massive, massive amount of data that they had acquired. And after that, she, she returned to university as an information specialist at the University of San Diego today. 
uh, where she's the project leader of the Neuroscience Information Framework, which is a plant-based inventory bringing together more science of resources on neuroscience. Um, we're happy to have you here. And, uh, welcome. Please welcome um, Anita Brandes.
with the description of GFAP. And um, over the next couple of years, what happens is that Millicorp was actually bought up by EMD. And now, when um, I access this uh, this month, now there are 51 antibodies um, in the uh, Millicorp catalog. So what does a researcher do? Well, a researcher goes and tells his students, his postdocs, uh, his graduate students, whoever is around, to go and find and track down which antibody it was, which is not easy. And um, when I look at a picture like this, um, I don't think that this is just a pretty river flowing around a rock. I think of this as the literature. That is the literature because it is a point of fact. It is a stable, steady component. It will stay this way forever. It's the PDF, right? Or if you really want to actually print it out, it's the paper thing. Right? And this is the internet. The internet is a river. Just because you go to google.com and you search the same thing, doesn't mean that it's the same thing that was there yesterday. Actually, Google updates its indices about every two days. So the internet that you saw two days ago is not the same internet that you saw today. In fact, age rankings change. You might Google yourself once in a while. What comes back will change, and it will change back drastically. OK. So the classes of problems that we ran into when we started this little project were classes of problems dealing with insufficient data. Most publications had insufficient data in the methods to actually identify the read. There's a time dependency. So of these 40 antibodies listed, one month after the publication on the producer's uh, website, which ones were there when the person actually went in more than a year prior to publication in most cases? How many of those 40 were there? Were there 50 at the time? We have no idea. We cannot track this down. There's vendor transitions also, as I uh, demonstrated. Um, in our very brief survey to start this project, or end it, however you like to say, we looked at a journal of neuroscience, one volume of the uh, Journal of Neuroscience, about eight articles, 95 unique antibodies, uh, 52 didn't contain enough information uh, to determine what the catalog number could be, could potentially be. Only about 10% actually contained the catalog number. A few of these antibodies were identified with either a clone number, which is not, not a unique identifier, or a catalog number. The supplier and uh, the city and state where they were was almost only Now, this is really uh, unacceptable in science. OK. So we didn't bother asking the robot or training robot to try to do this. OK. So really, the way that we solve this problem is not to go forward and try to train really great robots like this. If we can't do this, the robots really cannot do it either. And um, our solution became, well, Let's see if we can do something a little bit different. So what we did, if I put in the background here, we smiled in this, uh, this uh, and his hordes of, of treasure, we actually created hordes of antibodies. And we went to all of the producers of antibodies, and we tried to grab all of the data that they had. And we did. So we have about 2.2 something million antibodies at this point. We've assigned them unique identifiers. And um, you can actually uh, access each of the uh, unique identifiers by using the URL. So we keep these things. We try to keep them stable over the years. We uh, try to resolve these identifiers because it's in the on registry number slash the antibody ID. That is guaranteed to work no matter what we do with our website. Um, we can consolidate these antibodies because actually antibodies get bought and sold by different companies. Believe it or not, we can keep track of those. Um, and now we would like to ask authors to use them in papers because tracking down an antibody shouldn't be that hard. OK. We also created a nice new so. And for some antibodies, since we've been working very closely with the journal of comparative neurology, 
we're um, starting to get these nice references in for some of the antibodies, but not for others. I won't show you all the numbers of the antibodies. Um, instead, I'll show you. Be librarians, sorry. <laughs> so, how do we ask authors to change their ways? Anyone got any ideas? Seems like a pretty good group. All right, so um, in fact, that's a really good idea. Uh, let me show you how, we, how that happens. All right, no, 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 that's great, that's great. All right, so this is a few numbers of about uh, here 4,000 uh, commercial antibodies that were identified in the Journal of Comparative Neurology. Journal of Comparative Neurology is a Wiley journal. Um, it has a head editor um, by the name of Cliff Saber. Cliff has been an anatomist for many, many, many years. He's one of those old guys that points to all the little notes. Uh, but he is a fantastic, fantastic researcher and has been absolutely burned by antibodies as a reagent. So when he uh, became the head editor of the Journal of Comparative Neurology, he cracked the whip and said, you, thou shalt not publish unless thou does proper identification of these reagents. And he did. And you notice that compared to the Journal of Neuroscience, which had about 13% uh, catalog numbers uh, in our sample and 6% for that one, um, he gets about 92% uh, catalog numbers for, uh, for uh, uh, commercial antibodies. So uh, coincidentally, the lowest retraction rate. OK. Um, is this problem just dealing with antibodies? Now, I've only talked about antibodies, but it's only one out of many different reagents and, uh, that are inside of methods. And so there are other resource types. There are organisms, there are cell lines, there are constructs, knockdown reagents. And for this study, um, by a couple of colleagues of ours that came out just uh, last year, we actually looked at all of these different reagents and see that the problem across both disciplines and across reagents is very, very dire. Okay. So what we're having is, at least in neuroscience, which uh, some of you uh, work with here, we see that in terms of constructs, the identifiability of these reagents is extremely low. Organisms actually across different disciplines is pretty good, but no science to do with that. Um, we as neuroscience need to have some place to improve. Uh, in any case, antibody are, are pretty much generally bad. Uh, identifiability was less than remember, roughly around 50% across the different disciplines. And by the way, this didn't uh, it didn't matter um, the impact factor in this paper. It didn't matter uh, you know how um, uh, how stringent the instructions to authors were. Generally speaking, it seemed to be editor involvement actually that, that changed any of this. So, are we doing that? Like the Statue of Liberty in all films at the end of the world. Um, well, let me introduce you guys to the Urban Lab. The Urban Lab uh, is a great lab. Uh, it's a standard lab. Now lots of people, lots of graduate students. Here are the Urban Lab antibodies. Do you recognize anything? So we call the spreadsheet. Lovely spreadsheet. They tell you when they bought it, where it's being kept. They have the catalog numbers. They have the lot numbers. This is a very organized lab. But now, if we look at their publications, the urban lab publications do as poor a job as anybody else in terms of identifying these reagents that they keep track of. So. So, so what can we learn from this? It looks like authors and scientists either are schizophrenic or they're potentially not the same people. <laughs> or maybe both. Who knows? All right. But they don't think about reagent provenance when they go into the mode of I'm going to publish a paper. They actually don't think about provenance at all. They have
have something else that they're worried about. They're, they're worried about impressing their colleagues and everything else. So we're asking handful reminders may be a way to kind of solve some problems. Okay. So in 2012, we got a, a group of about 25 journal editors uh, together. Um, the INCA, which is the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, they have three times closer, um, actually paid for a really nice dinner so they showed up. Like, that's that was good. Um, so they showed up and what essentially came out of that meeting, um, and there were some, you know, there were some kind of big names in there. Um, uh, HR was there, all of the big uh, 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 neuroscience publish uh, publications were there. Um, what we wanted coming out of this were that resources should be machine readable. Um, they would be outside, they would be available outside of the paywall, and that there would be uniform access across publishers and journals. And those are huge. I know they're a very tall order, but um, we have some ideas from Elsevier and from others of how to actually do that without changing your entire publication process, all of your infrastructure, um, to be able to accomplish this. So the current work with the resource identification in the neuroscience literature group um, is that we've established the group. We are starting to make uh, uh, these, uh, we have started to make all of these identifiers available and share you with the antibody registry. So for antibodies, we have this. For uh, organisms, we have this. We've gotten uh, buy-in from um, five of the major model organism communities, which, again, organisms were a really big problem um, identified by that paper. Um, and we also have uh, uh, software, scientific software tools um, and databases. Um, those are all now uh, key on these reading identifiers. There's a single website. You can check that out, SciCrunch slash resources where we've brought together these uh, data into one place where an author can go in, type in their tool, and find it. Type in their antibody and find it. We have prepared instructions to authors. We've prepared letters, and those are all available um, on the site for the, with the uh, working group. And we're still kind of in progress testing everything, performing some usability studies. OK, this is the working group, and there's Martin's picture. <clears throat> so um, the uh, projected launch, uh, which was uh, actually in the 2013 follow-on to the original meeting, um, that uh, follow-on was actually uh, wasn't catered with, with a big dinner, so only the publishers showed up. Um, <laughs> it was a Society for Neuroscience meeting and, um, this last year in November, and. The publishers maybe said, okay, we can, we can implement something. Um, what we could do is we could start this uh, in February. I think that was the idea. All right, so what we have in terms of this pilot project um, to get resources identified is we have, uh, we originally got 25 journals. We uh, are starting to bring on some more um, from these four publishers with one set of author guidelines. This would be a potentially very huge. Um, there's a press release from Elsevier, and uh, believe it or not, we actually even got the Wall Street Journal. So fun. Um, now, how can any of you help? Um, I would love for you all to join this effort, endorse, uh, send your authors our way to find their identifiers. Um, Anita Ward, actually, from Elsevier Labs, came up with a brilliant idea of how to put these things outside of the paywall. Uh, without changing anything on, on your back ends. Um, it's just to put these identifiers as keywords. Keywords which are actually never consistent to use. So if they become keywords, then any search of PubMed will actually be able to bring them back. Um, so uh, instructions to authors and sample letters are also available. These things have been written, they've been embedded. And um, that is roughly. I think my but I don't know. That was a kind of Good. <laughs> so, we have some questions. Yeah? 
for the benefit of those people. Um, for the benefit of those people who are not involved, might, might you say something about force of them, which I think is such an important. Many people won't know it. Yeah. How many people here know Force 11? You should. <laughs> so Force 11 came out of um, a, a meeting called the Beyond the PDF meeting, which uh, revolution, which, which has an aim of revolutionizing publishing. Um, that happened in my building in San Diego. Um, it was put together by Phil Horn, who has now just become the data czar. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Um, but just as of uh, about a month ago or so, setting up a new institute at NIH. Um, so Force 11 came out of that meeting, and it continues to be incredibly, incredibly active. Um, it has uh, hundreds of members, all of which yell at each other fairly consistently. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much. But they have a lot of uh, task forces on standards and other things. Um, they want to, they really do want to revolutionize publishing. And this is where a lot of the ideas, the new ideas, are really brought out and vetted. Um, so this is one of them, this is one of the working groups. So uh, there are others on data citation practices and other things. Check it out. Um, you know, you posed the question, you know, why is it that uh, you know, scientists keep track of these things and they don't publish them? You know, at least in our studies of uh, chemical combinations in the patent literature, I mean, there's all kinds of efforts to kind of use non-standard names. I mean, there's, there's, you, know, you know, firms and scientists are, are working very hard to occlude and obscure the kind of the traces of, of things that they're using. Um, so. Uh, you know, how, how does one think about this in relation to you know either publisher mandates or it, it seems that it would suggest that softer measures are not going to work. Um, yeah, the NIH is also carrying a big stick. <laughs> so uh, the mid meeting was actually at NIH, and NIH is getting very very interested in making sure that these things are more traceable. Um, and largely, it's not just because the companies they have, and certainly the companies also do a lot of occlusion in terms of, well, this is this antibody, but this is a different antibody, and they actually have 10 antibodies you can buy from six different uh, antibody vendors, in, in my experience. And um, actually, four of them will be exactly the same antibody, but the antibody vendors will not tell you that. So um, essentially, there's a lot of waste of effort, there's a lot of waste of money. Um, the NIH, the taxpayers, would like to calm down. Um, but it will take work. And so we have a mechanism, technically, to be able to do that. We actually have a company um, called Antibodies Online that's come for this, which is going to help us uh, try to consolidate some of this data where it is possible. But a lot of times that's going to uh, cut into the bottom line of the antibody vendors. So this is something that they are, um, they would like to. Uh, in the literature. Um, but the NIH is paying for this. They are starting to get a larger stick. So I think if the publishers come along, if the authors come along, if the vendors come along to some extent, and they have by letting us have their data in the Amazon registry, I think we'll all start to move to a much better place in, in this. Um, and and as I said, at least with this lab and with many other labs like it, it should be a trivial thing to ask for to pull these from catalog numbers. And I just had a question about your solution for getting that outside the paywall. Because I think that's a really important point that, that has to be mindful. People have to be able to find that um, information. But I don't know what keywords. I mean, if you have a paper where you have a lot of different reagents, organisms, um, and you're going to put all of those identifiers on the keywords, so I think all of the publishers here are going to say, ah, oh, we have usually like a limit of 10 keywords. And I don't know, have you thought that through about um, making a different kind of keyword key? Or is it ultimately? Yeah, I would love to talk to PubMed about that. It will take another four years for that to <laughs> <time. laughs> So what I what I can say is let's do what we can now um, and let's start 
to do this. Um, with the journals that we have, we will certainly run into roadblocks and problems, and then we can start kicking them appropriately in appropriate places so that they actually give us a new keyword field. Um, but making this outside of the table is going to be absolutely critical. Um, for semantic enhancement of the text after we get these identifiers in, an identifier is essentially a uniquely identifiable tag. If somebody puts in that they used RID 12345 into a paper, I can pull back all the papers that have monoclonal antibodies that are being used against a particular target. The authors don't have to specify any of this information anymore. And if there's a question raised about that antibody in some future time, which in the case often, we can go back and tag all the papers immediately that actually had a question raised against one of the two agents. This is huge. You cannot do this today. But if we can get these identifiers into some place, now um, I think for all journals, you can always put it in the methods. And in those <coughs> cases, we can get at that information because of text mining and other things that we design, or we'll be in the process of signing. Uh, Springer has an API that we use. Um, Nature has an API, uh, and other publishers are actually, uh, you know, either starting to bring that on board or it's giving us uh, exclusive rights. Or not, sorry, some rights after a year of legal frankly, um, to to actually text mine their content for those things. But putting this outside of the pool wall is way easier. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very. I'm, um, um, I'm very thankful that this has just been mentioned because uh, it brings us down to the, the, the topic of the whole day. Um, as we're going to talk about the, the transition in the publishing process, and now we see a very specific transition, obviously. It's, um, the fact that a particular piece of research paper needs to be uh, added on with, let's say, external an external registry, for example. And it shows us that, uh, that the, the process of implementing such things shows us actually that publishers are able to 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 um, to, to be engaged in that process. It's nothing that comes over them and needs to be done a lot, and uh, that has to worry them. And at the same time, uh, it may lead uh, this is uh, a, positive, a positive. It may lead to another road to what publisher are actually there for, because I can imagine that I see the, the, the right to speak for antibodies. Um, in the next tool or in the next paper, there might be other um, external, let's say, resources, validation um, hubs, whatever, that need to be connected as well um, to create then the, the, um, the value of the paper in the future. And that's certainly something that, that publishers uh, might want to look more into. It. And organize for their readers and, and authors. I have one more question there, and my time will be able to ask a question as well, and then we need to move forward. Hi, this is uh, in person for follow-ups. Um, not really a question, just a thought. Have you considered for kinds of like some post publication? Yeah, actually, yeah. Antibody Antibody Center has been around for years. Antibodies Online has a cool little survey where they're trying to give away uh, uh, coffee mugs and t-shirts. Uh, they're actually a German company. Uh, but they, they are trying to encourage authors to do some post-publication annotation of their papers by giving away free mugs. It hasn't been very successful yet, but we'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I just wanted to mention that February fine that we're doing that. Want to say a few words? Oh, um, so so Martin, the, so the, the the thing that we're really moving for uh, forward with in, in February is um, with at least these twenty five journals. But again, it's a more. Um, so that's great. Uh, the the thing that we would like to do again is to as minimally impact the um, the publishing process as possible but get these identifiers in. And that minimal impact is to um, simply ask the authors at submission. So um, by, there's a nice letter that we've prepared and edited and 
as you'd like, um, and send it out to the authors. So the, uh, the uh, editor, not the, probably the chief editor, but whoever is the, the appropriate point person, would send out this letter and ask the authors to essentially go through their paper and pull out the antibodies, the reagents, the tools that they might be using, and give these identifiers. We even have little cyclist buttons. Um, probably show that with them. Um, but in any case, the, the website is immensely easy. The, um, the mm -hmm. editors basically said that, you know, yes, while we would like to have absolutely everything tagged under the sun, we would like to start with a very small set. And antibodies are a particular pain point, so antibodies are in there as reagents. Um, animals, organisms, uh, the, the identifiers from the model organism databases specifically should be in there. And there's a little format, there's even a button to cite this, open it up, and put that in your methods. And that should be available to all the authors now. Um, and so with the, uh, the February deadline approaching, we are um, about to send out a letter to all of our participating journal editors to get us in touch with their appropriate um, copy editors or whoever they feel is the right person dealing with the, uh, the public uh, in order to send these letters out and see what kind of um, what kind of uh, um, compliance we get from the authors, because really this isn't going to work unless there's some direct interaction with the authors, and that's going to have to happen with the journal. So um, we would really love all of your support in, in doing this, and the theory is that this would be relatively simple for the authors to do. Um, we will keep track in terms of uh, trying to find what the impact of this is. Um, we will share that data freely with you, including this, this online survey. Um, we're more than happy to do that. We're more than happy to modify the survey a little bit if you have any specific questions, like will you never publish in, your, you know, in this journal again if we ask you to do this? But we felt that it was really important to do like a uniform body, so as many journals as possible we ask the same thing. And we're asking for lots and lots of publisher involvement, lots of involvement from the different <coughs> organism communities to, um, again, blog and tweet and do all of those things so that people see this from multiple places. And if people see this from multiple places, then maybe if you don't ask them, maybe they'll do it spontaneously. But I think <coughs> we need to try to consolidate. Um, so thank you very much again. I really appreciate your attention today. Well, thank you very much. Okay. okay, well, um, let me introduce uh, the third of our speakers this morning. Um, we are very happy to have Anthony Watkinson here. Um, Anthony has an academic and professional career that is so um, Barriers with so many different aspects that it would consume too much time to, to notice or mention all that right now. I just uh, mentioned his start as an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical historian, and in the end, or where actually he is now, as one of the founders of the cyber, the cyber Research Network, which is an independent research group focused on, on different aspects of digital change in institutions. And, um, we're very, we're very happy to have you here. <laughs> okay. Um, I just before I start, I want to make another suggestion to Anita. Sorry, Anita, in case if anybody's here from online editorial systems of various sorts, like uh, for example, Perry's editorial manager, I think there is. This is by far the easiest way of getting it into the into the whole process because publishers are all deeply pressed at the moment on the basis of time taken in the reviewing process. This is the big problem for them. I mean, really, to send out letters separately is death. It's got to be in the process. In the process, Mark, any thoughts about this? Well, yes. Um, I was saying that. That, that is great, and, and we have the facility to gather all sorts of... This is Mark Hester of Aries, This is important, I think. 
Yeah. More important than anything I'm going to say. Um, well, my reaction to that would be that, yes, we already have the um, facility to gather all sorts of metadata during the submission process. Um, but what we found, um, talking to all sorts of organizations, including KUDOS, um, has been that um, you come into a conflict there because um, publishers love it um, and researchers love it if we can gather this metadata. But authors absolutely hate it and they regard it as yet another piece of information that they have to provide. Um, and it really turns them against um, the, the online submission process. It, it really um, means that you um, shift the responsibility okay. <laughs> away to someone else. <laughs> it's more of a problem. Okay, that's a thought. Anyhow, sorry, Peter. Sorry, sorry, uh, organizers. I just thought it was worth bringing up this, as it was such a key area. Okay, um, yeah, I'm. I am a researcher and have been a researcher since 2002, but I've been I'm self-employed since 1998, and I do a number of other things, which involve, for example, representing publishing organisations. So I'm a bit split on this. I have published quite a lot. I am a researcher. I am part of a research team, so I do qualify in one sense. So um, this is going to be very quick because what I'm going to do is hand over not exactly this presentation, but something similar and more uh, upgraded for you because I put a lot of references in. So when the time comes, we start to go up. Or if you want to email me. Um, personally, I'm very happy to send you the presentation because lot, they say lots of references in it. So, um, yeah, the presentation falls into two parts. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, now, the reason that I'm talking about this is because of something I wrote to Baz, and he's taken it up and given me a title. And the, the, um, as you see, I have, as a publisher, my publishing life, I've always thought, we are, our job, like librarians, of course, in a different way, is to facilitate the researchers' activities. We are there as servants of the academic community. And I wrote, a, uh, I think it's mentioned, a Logos article, 2006. So in the end, in the end the academics will decide whether they, in this case, is open access. They will decide whether they want to be open access. Um, actually, they don't, they won't be the deciding factor. The deciding factor is going to be the government and funders. I think we can all agree on that. Because they are going to decide. And if you talk to funding bodies, they say, we don't care what researchers, if they're at a bad moment, you know, want. We know what is best for the economy and for the future of research. Two things being linked. Now, I'm going to give you, this is a various slides, but I'm going to pass right through just to show you I've done a bit of homework. Okay, um, this US one is interesting, but I won't go into it just to just show you. A lot of it is about, um, about the uh, getting the access to tax money. It's about the pace of scientific discovery. However, there is also this one. And in the end, you find, if you look at this stuff, that a lot of it is to drive economic growth and create jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. The emphasis is moving towards, out of the idea that everything should be free, if everything being free will help science well, scholarship progressed to the idea that scholarship and science have to serve the national economy, the, Europe, the European economy. So you can see distinct difficulties here in relation to the researcher, the government and researcher contact or interface. They have not talked to researchers very much. And they don't explain, on the whole, what the new system and the new publishing will look like. I think that's a fair comment. 
they say, the only agenda is change from access to knowledge. After all, richly open access was the whole thrust of it, led by librarians, I should point out initially, was to make sure that people who couldn't afford to pay for the research outputs should actually be able to get hold of it in the future. And now it's moved very much to the concept of reuse, and it's very important. And reuse is seen as important because it enables the industry particularly to reuse the material, people outside the academic community. Actually, interestingly, there has been, as far as I can tell, very little reaction to the CCBY license, which in the UK is part of the deal. The research funders, the research bodies in the UK, and the Welcome, the Welcome Trust, the biggest research funder in biomedicine in the UK, are insisting that CCBY, which means availability to open material to be used by anybody as long as there's an attribution. That is not worrying researchers, except the humanities researchers, who got very, very excited. Very excited, because they say that their translation rights and so on have been lost, and the only way they can combat any problems of distortion of their ideas, and plagiarism, and so forth, is if they go to, go to law. But we'll see about that. Scientists are not bothered. Now, that's the first, second, the first part of my presentation. The second part is about the research Cyber has been doing for the Sloan Foundation. And I'll give you the de more details in a second. Um, this is to do with trust. It's to do with academic trust in the res information resources which they use, which they cite, and which and those channels which they decide to disseminate through. This is a description of what we've done. Yeah. The thinking on our side when we presented this to the CERN Foundation, was that there have been very, very important changes because of the web, and that presumably there will be significant impacts on the way that researchers work, especially in relation to trust and trust and information. We were worried about trust as a concept. Can we thought, how do we explain what we mean by trust? And we had all sorts of little attempt to define what we meant by trust. But in fact, nobody was the slightest bit worried. All the research that we spoke to, the word trust meant something. Whether it meant the same thing to all of them, we don't know. But it meant something. You have no problems. OK, I'm giving this very simple and straightforward short description of the key conclusions. Peer review even more enthusiasm than in previous surveys, uh, surveys. Everybody, without exception, although they hated sometimes the way peer review was actually operated, they felt all sorts of naughty things were going on around the editors and the boards, they were all adamant that peer review was absolutely important to any information source that they used. This is why they continued to make a distinction between published materials, including conference proceedings where published, and anything in the social media. That doesn't mean they didn't use the social media, but they didn't trust it in the same way. However, there was also a perception among the researchers we spoke to, and also we questionnaire, two different bodies, in fact, that that had, they had become more suspicious of all forms and all types of information, more suspicious. 
and they spend more time or prefer always to scrutinize anything that they, if they have time to do so, to see if it looked to them good, looked to good information, the methodology was correct, it looked to be sensible, citing, citing relevant articles and so forth. They prefer to use their judgment. Okay, and move on rather quickly because I see this at the time. Okay, the most important thing in relation to this present, this um, session is the question of politics. <coughs> and actually, everybody seemed to assume that publishers would remain there. There was nobody said we were wanting a rid of publishers, or almost nobody, in any of the ways we actually interrogated the researchers. Elsevier was mentioned. Sometimes the, word, the wording went more or less. I know elsewhere have made much too much money, which is terribly wicked, but they are a good professional publisher, and I publish with them. Elsewhere people met. Last one was mentioned. I'll come back to that. That's the only, virtually the only other brand name which was known. No, very little knowledge or public discussion of the mechanics of publishing, except when journal editors who were real poor were present at focus groups because they dominated the conversation, talking about the way they did peer review. Open, open access, okay. I thought this would be interesting. Amazing number of people, especially interviewees, were suspicious of open access. And the reason is very, very straightforward. It's because of all the emails they get. I don't know about you, but I get, as a researcher, I get two or three emails a week. And people, some people claim six or seven emails a week, asking me to contribute to some journal I never heard of in a different field, like a neuroscience or journal or something. And this is, this is a big, they hate this. They feel they must do something badly wrong. And of course, they're probably right. Um, but on the whole, they accepted that there could be good OA journals, this is where PLOS One came in, and they were um, not, only a few of them were worried about the concept of having to pay. Some people follow the Kent Anderson approach of believing um, via, like open access is inherently more um, liable to be distorted by payment, but only a very small number. Good in principle, but money. Pathetic, on our survey results, pathetic um, requests for the publishers to do something about the business of having to pay from countries like um, Rwanda and Uganda. Please, please stop having to try to charge us, okay? Now, I'm not going to mention that. Um, little mention of funders. We did a, a study in 2006 which showed that funders were regarded as the biggest barrier to innovation, much, much more so than lack of access. We won't go into that. Transmission. Yeah. Is the current system broken? Very, very few failures. Here are two examples. And the bro brokenness was related to the way usually the theory of view was exercise, how it was handled, not against peer review, but how it was handled. It wasn't to do with access on the whole, amazingly. Here's a, a typical example, sorry, not a typical example, one of the very few examples of, of a, a suggestion of transformation of the same system. The International Clearinghouse of the test publishers and journals the echoes here of deconstruction. Deconstruction was not mentioned at all, breaking up the different models. I won't mention social media. More on social media, but I'll send you this if you want to. I've only got one minute left, you see. Okay. 
dramatic picture is that the funders, including particularly government, is reducing policy to the variance of the way researchers are actually doing research. Researchers have a long history of adjusting. What, but we don't really know what the shape of the future and how public publishing look, will look. Will the money be available in transition to an open access future? If a green solution reinvents publishing, how then will that be financed? Let me explain. Professor Harnack, who I've been in dialogue with for many, many years, openly, as I point out, has finally admitted that he sees the whole publishing, of, whole publishing system falling over if we get to a tipping point where enough material is available or open access, so that there will be enforced open access. And the open access, new publisher under open access will just organize peer review. I find that difficult to believe that something will satisfy the research. I think of all the other things we've been talking about just now, for example. And also, um, there's a basic premise which we put forward some years ago, is that publishers so researchers are part of the general public. They look up train times. They may mostly look up pornography, whatever it is. But they also, so when they do their research activities, they expect the same level of functionality and the information sources they get. If they don't get this, they're fed up. Aren't they, Anita? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so publishers all the time have to invest in more and more technology. There's lots of people here who are aware of that. It changes all the time. We're constantly doing more. What's going to happen to all that stuff? Public Central might do it. We don't know. They're waiting. OK, that must be it. So that good quick timing? OK. No. I'll be here for the rest of the time. I, I want to, OK, question over there. You're not turned on. Uh, <laughs> so you are turned on, but your machine is not turned on. It's easy to repeat. I can hear you anyhow, so. Dr. Sibylle Strobel, Freelance and Copy Editor. Um, you stated very clearly researchers do need publishers. They think they is, is that so? And why? I don't know. And how do publishers or the publishing process? as to adjust or change to fulfill the future needs of researchers? I am not, I'm not, this is, this is something that surprised me. There was an assumption that publishers would always be there. We were talking about, of course, about the information sources, and it turned out that by far the most information source were journal articles, so naturally got them to publishers. But there wasn't a suggestion that uh, everything should be sacred up to the blog or something of this sort. The people who, did, when we did raise that question, for example, I talked to mathematicians. There's a man in, uh, with the name of McGowers, who is a very distinguished British mathematician, who started doing his work on blogs. So you've got 10 minutes, you don't need to worry too much. But uh, when I spoke to other mathematicians, they said, oh no, we can't possibly do that. All sorts of people will get into the act, and we'll have to suffer from all the noise and people who are unqualified. Noise was the big problem with the social media. I said so it was not. That's what they're feeling. I'm just saying that, in fact, they expected journals and publishers to continue to exist. But they saw ways in which they might improve. But most of the ways they might improve were within the system, like better peer review, better control, um, and, of course, to some extent, better, no, better access was hardly mentioned. I'm sorry, it just it should have been, but it wasn't. We really had to raise it. Yeah. It's interesting that um, open access wasn't really raised by the uh, by the researchers, but it doesn't surprise me terribly because open access is there through Public Central for all. These the are not many biomedical people, though. Um, you see, in fact, we had half of them were social scientists. We didn't have any humanities people. There's something, and the remaining ones were very few of them biomedical. The biomedical ones did raise Public Central. Sorry, but they were very much a minority. Unfortunately, we were dependent upon the people who were willing to be interviewed questionnaire. In the questionnaires, there was mention of PubMed Central, but not many. Um, I agree with you. But there's, no, there's nothing equivalent in other fields, actually, except in ast astrophysics. Okay. <clears throat> no, no, with the, uh, well, the data service as well, yes. Yeah. 
and there were some other they are coming. They are coming from Windsor, is different. They they felt that until they had published. I know it sounds wrong. They do. Um, Anthony, I'm Mark Harden. I'm from Mosaic. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not really a question for you. It's a question for Dr. Evans, in a way. Um, Dr. Evans, email. Um, oh, no. But I was just thinking about what you were saying about the effect of uh, funders on um, the science agenda. And I wonder whether that relates to the conservatism in research agendas and risk taking. And I think whether that's... there's some sort of analysis to be done on risk taking in relation to how research projects are funded. I think you mentioned it, didn't you? But still, please. Um, I, I, I did uh, talk about that. I mean, I, I also, I mean, I have uh, with some other research that shows that also, you know, academics um, end up driving a fair bit of the, the ship, you get to biomedicine especially, to, uh, to open access. Um, they are, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I wouldn't do it. Forgive me, I, I didn't really um, explain this enough. Sorry, I was very impressed. There were people, we did talk to people about their connections, I could get raising it. Um, and uh, there were many people who would, in principle, everybody would principle keep on open access. The problem is when it came to the crunch, they said we just don't trust open access journals except plus one. I mean, it sounds ludicrous, but that is the case. And I had a lot of time arguing that open access was intrinsically a good thing and that it couldn't be run properly. I really, this is, a, a, as you know, because it's a quite unusual situation for me, but it has that. It was, it was just a suspicion because of the predatory act, uh, journals. And this was true right across the board. And when the questionnaire as well, there was huge suspicion because of the predatory evidence the journal. There wasn't people, that, that, that was where it came from. And I may, may, may add a comment on, on the partners as well from my personal experience. Um, I think it's, we actually heard it, it becomes clear that um, it makes a lot of sense to think more closely about the role of, of funders and, and how they are able to, to influence their, um, the process of science. At the same time, it's putting a challenge to the publishing industry is if you can imagine that um, there's a, only a very relatively limited uh, number of very um, influential funding bodies in the world as it is in, for example, in Germany. And the big dogs tend to, to talk with the big dogs. So um, if, you come, if it comes to publishers, um, my impression is that this kind of give, gives an advantage to the bigger, more established publishing houses um, to get into the contact and discussion uh, with the funders. And that might put in, in disadvantage to smaller publishers who may not have the resources. Um, to constantly meet um, with funding bodies and keep uh, personal contact and discussion going uh, with these very influential decision makers. I agree entirely. I've tried to persuade the publishing body I'm associated with. It's not much difficult with SDF, but you try to engage. But it's terribly difficult to engage. I've been and had lunch with people, not a great deal, and there's a blank wall, actually. They don't really think of publishers have anything to say, because they just nasty people with the feet off the process. They don't, one of the things that you find is people don't realize quite how much contact publishers have with the academic community. I mean, we all of us who are in publishing have spent years and years being part of an academic community, whether we're in that field or not. I mean, I was a mathematics publisher, and I have no mathematics, but I was very well known. I was actually asked to join the leading mathematical society in the UK, and although I wasn't a mathematician, you get very close to the people. We all know that. But they don't understand it. They live in a different world. They're social scientists and econ economists particularly. They have no idea what goes on, I'm afraid. The connection is a, a great keyword which leads me to that break that we are um, about to enjoy. Um, I kindly invite you, everybody, um, to use the break to make a connection with our speakers as well as our, um, as well as our visitors. And um, there's a couple of more and instructions from home. Yes, let me. Just to have uh, three lines of text. I started uh, AP or AP or APA, some people call it, uh, nine years ago, after, one year after the Max Planck Foundation, in this very neighborhood, uh, started with the Open Access Declaration. And I found it very useful. I just have to spring the lack and uh, being free. 
I could speak. So I talked to the Max Planck Foundation and other learned uh, scientists and said, oh, it's, I think it's about time that publishers and science, so science organizations, scientists, are meeting in the same room and talk to each other. And the first uh, Alpha conference was held nine years ago. And in those days, we talked about content communism and things like that. So I think we are well ahead in time. And uh, I'm very pleased that so many people from all kinds of organizations and the call the call from stakeholders are meeting today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. Um, what I wanted to say is it's coffee break right now. And the second thing I wanted to say is the toilets are upstairs. So you have to go up and then turn right and then you see the way. And then have half an hour for networking and then you come back here, hopefully, um, for the other session. And I hope you have enjoyed this part. I think it's happy on Monday morning to hear all those things going on. But now you can have fresh air and time for discussion. See you later. I did, I did.